had directors be like, moan louder, moan louder. And I'm like, I, I don't want to moan louder. Like, I'm, I'm just moaning how I moan. I'm wearing that badge of honor very proudly right now. <laughs> we just have so much fun, you know, playing together. So Eric was like, well, you know, you could play the tambourine. And I said, uh, I'm not playing the tambourine. I love the love, I for the love. I need to be outside. That's my office. <laughs> and really, your, your level of professionalism and, and streamlined is just, it's, it's really should be applauded. You've done a great, you've done a great thing. Like this is really, I looked at some of your, your previous uh, interviews and really exceptional. I'm really, I'm happy to be a part of, of the legacy you're building with uh, Eclectic Arts. Same. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm Mark Sugiyama from Eclectic Arts based here in Seattle, Washington, in the United States of America. And thank you so much for joining me on this Saturday, the 26th of March, 2022. And uh, as always, a few housekeeping details before we get to uh, today's interview. Uh, I do have a lot of live streams coming up. And um, for those that were asking me about what happened to Thursday's live stream, uh, my guest is originally from Kazakhstan, um, and so we decided to change the day and time uh, specifically so that her following, which is quite sizable over in Kazakhstan, could actually tune in live with us. So um, that live stream from this past Thursday has been rescheduled to this Friday, uh, this upcoming Friday, the, four, uh, the 1st of April at 9 p.m. Pacific time. So it is still on the, well, it's now on the schedule again, um, but this way uh, over in Kazakhstan, it should be around 9 or 10 a.m. for uh, folks over there. Uh, to tune in. But uh, coming up before that, this Tuesday, the, uh, I don't even have the date down, <laughs> the 29th at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. For those that were interested in the Haley Reed and the Charlie Ford interviews, I have Marika Hase coming from Japan. Um, and then on Wednesday, back to back, I have at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time as well, I have Hannah Grace joining me, or scheduled to join me at least. And then um, on Friday, I already mentioned, we have Aizan Laiji from, originally from Kazakhstan, who's in this wonderful film back here, Tomaris. And then I also have a, a wonderful metal band from Chicago next Sunday, the third, um, Chains Over Razors is scheduled to join me. And uh, I will be back at an in-person uh, play slash musical tonight. So that's uh, still going on and keeping me very busy. The Seattle Jewish Film Festival kicked off uh, virtually on Thursday. And thank you to Pamela Lavitt for coming on on Tuesday and talking about the festival. She's the director. Their first in-person screening is today, uh, downtown Seattle, for those that are local to the greater Seattle area. Um, and once we get into the full first full week of April, I know I will be back at least one concert uh, doing photography and reviews. I've got the Seattle Rep. I'm looking at my master schedule. I've got the Village Theater. I've got Broadway at the Paramount with um, they're doing the Carol King musicals coming to town. So there's a lot of in-person, virtual, everything going on. If you'd like to know more about what I have coming up, you can follow me as a collective arts media, one word on Instagram. That's where I post everything first. And then some of that information migrates over to other social media platforms. If this is your first time joining me on my YouTube channel, if you could do me a huge favor and hit that subscribe button and also the notification bell, I'd like, uh, I'd appreciate that. And if you're on the Twitch side of things, if you could follow me over there, because that's where I started all of this virtual work almost two years ago um, was on Twitch. So uh, I will definitely follow people back from there. And if you're really enjoying what I've been doing on my channel, um, if you're new to it and take a moment later on today to kind of go through it and you really like what you're seeing, um, I always appreciate tips and um, any kind of donations through PayPal. The link is in the YouTube description of every video live stream that I do um, on my channel. So I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, so I'm just glad to be here with Black trying to find this balance between the in-person world of all the events and the virtual world that I've been doing for the last almost two years. And I'm really uh, looking forward to just seeing what the future holds. So let's kind of get to things. And before we do that, let me change this button. And um, hi, Ove, good to see you over in Norway. And um, 
oh yeah, and we have our, um, let's see, Mud over in, oh, in Perth in Western Australia. Good to see you as well. Thank you for joining us. And like, as I mentioned, let's get to things. My guest today is a talented musician and artist. She recently released a new single and video for the song, Turn Away. We saw a little clip of that from her upcoming EP. Please welcome to the Eclectic Arts Virtual Studio, C. Lemon. Hi. Hi, Natalie, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, always. Okay, well, let's kind of start off with um, uh, the clip that we saw for Turn Away and that particular song, and then maybe we'll kind of work our way back to the other two singles that you put out and the, the upcoming EP and everything else. So what's the story behind Turn Away? How did this song come to be? Yeah, um, so Turn Away is a song that is ironically about pe wanting people to not like perceive me. I think that um, especially now that when you release music, it feels so virtual and like everything happens over the internet. There's a fear of like, how are people seeing me? How are people seeing like the persona that I am? How are people seeing the, the music that I release? Are people perceiving it the same way that I perceive it? Um, and I think that that sort of stress and anxiety about like the way in which I'm perceived is what really inspired Turn Away. And my entire EP is is really around sort of the stresses and the anxieties of, of really being in your head. Um, and Turn Away is just sort of like one manifestation of that. Um, and uh, I write all of my music melody first. And so with Turn Away, I like started on the guitar, started with some like lead lines in the chorus and kind of go from there. And then I, I decide sort of what the song is going to be about as I'm like creating that melody already. So I'm definitely instruments first, um, but I always kind of have a sense of what I want to say in my songs and sort of like a general theme or something I want to bring forward. So with Turn Away, I was like, I know I want to write a song about what it feels like to be perceived as a person and as an artist. And uh, yeah, that's that sort of is the product of all of that thinking that happens in the pandemic where you're like, I hope people see me the way I want to be seen, you know? Okay, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And um, so as the song has been out for a little while now and the video, um, are you getting some feedback about the perception from people that it's <laughs> I mean. <laughs> It's, it's always funny, right? Because as an artist, like I'm releasing a song about like, maybe don't look at me too much. There's a line uh, in the chorus that says, stop seeing me like that. And so a lot of people are like, I love the song. I'm listening to it. I'm watching the video and I'm like, that's great, right? Um, but uh, people have been really, really positive and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been really exciting to release this song. Okay, and, 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 and well, one, that's good. And two, um, is there a certain perception that you want people to have of you then? Is there certain things that you like, you kind of prefer? Yeah, I guess the way that I think as any artist, you kind of know that not everyone that listens to your music or like sees what you put out can know the entire you. They can see like a sliver of you, which is like, especially on social media is like happy, excited, wanting to release music. Please listen to my music. Like, here's what it is. It's good. And you're like always kind of selling yourself. And then the person that I truly am like with my friends and my family and with myself is like what I would consider much more nuanced than that. And I think any artist is this way. That's like, it's impossible to know someone fully just through the perception that they have on the internet. So I think e even more than just exactly how do I want to be perceived by people on the internet? It's the like, I want to make sure that like artists are seen as whole people, just like everyone else. You know, when we put out music, we're like nuanced people besides just this one song that we're like, please listen to it. And I, I think it's always hard to, you know, especially with like TikTok and Instagram and social media being so prevalent, it's, it's can feel hard to be like, when I'm releasing something, people are recognizing that I'm just any other person trying to like make it. And there's lots of like sides of me that people might not be aware of. And yeah. You know, that's uh, very well said and very, and I totally relate to what you're talking about. Um, even yeah. having done this virtual world, as I mentioned in my intro um, for almost two years now, and it was something that was, and I've mentioned this before to other artists, 
It was the furthest thing from my mind. And as things kind of picked up, it's great. Don't get me wrong. I love the support. I love the people that tune in. Always been a strong supporter since May of last year. Um, and um, But at the same time, you're right. People can only get a certain perception of you, no matter how much they think they know you. And even for me, like if I am a fan of a certain band or something, I don't really know them. Right. I, I can watch a ton of interviews. I can go to all their shows, buy their merch, all that kind of thing. And I'm only getting certain parts of them. Um, if I lived around them for, you know, a few years, then maybe I can understand a little bit more what they're like. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's so easy for people to forget that um, artists are human, um, that they're, and especially with social media, you're going to put out what you want to put out, um, very, being very selective of that at times. And um, at the same time, people still don't know you. Um, right. and, and you probably are familiar with this type of thing when maybe someone does, you know, leave a comment or they DM you something, you're kind of like, you don't even have a clue <laughs> where you're coming from. But you know what? I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to move on to the next thing and stay positive. But, you know, th those people are out there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And even for me, <laughs> I was kind of, I was kind of dumbfounded when I started getting some of these DMs. I'm kind of like, really? You know, you're, you're going to write something this long <laughs> about like some comment I made in a live stream? Yeah, no, totally. I was just having a conversation with a friend, too, about how when you don't know someone very well and they call you by a nickname that you haven't like explicitly said hey this is my name it's like more of a nickname that you share amongst like friends or family how weird it is to be called by a nickname by somebody that you don't know that well and we were sort of discussing why is that such a funny thing it's like there's an intimacy in knowing someone and being like let in on a nickname and that being just like one form of the way you're perceived and how others can sometimes perceive you as like being closer, already knowing each other. And you're like, this is a stranger to me. I don't know you. I, I'm not ready to like share that level of intimacy. So I, I always think that there's like lots of manifestations of being like, whoa, like, are you seeing the way me the way that I see you? Are you seeing me the way that I see myself? There's like, there's always so much of that. Yeah, no, that's a great example. Um, it's probably why I don't mention um, any kind of nicknames. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, someone starts calling me that that I don't, I've never met in person, or don't consider a friend or a family member or, or colleague, or even it's like, yeah, I don't want to hear that from you. Just like right. I wouldn't want to say that to you either. I and mean, it's not right. my place. It's not my place. Right. Um, and I see, you know, always talking about you know the artist and the person need to be separate. Um, and yeah, we have all of us have different lives of what we do. Yeah. Um, but the internet and particularly social media has given everyone a platform, um, whether they deserve it or not, it's there. Um, but speaking of that type of thing, um, so we, we know the background behind Turn Away. Uh, what, when did you shoot and how did you shoot the music video for yeah. it? Yeah, the music video was so fun. Um, so I shot it at a little studio um, called Northlight. That's, um, they rent out a couple of different um, really, really beautiful studios in um, like the Soto E area, kind of the international district. Um, and the whole concept behind the music video was like people pulling me in lots of directions. I got all my friends together and, and we shot this video and they were so helpful and, and really great. Um, but I, I really wanted there to be some like themes of like me being pulled in different directions, which there's like people literally physically pulling me. And we got some like fun props, like a trophy, which is like, you know, the perception of being accomplished, being successful and people sort of like pulling that away from you, but you trying to hold on to it. Um, and uh, I, I really think that in terms of like looks of my music videos, I love watching videos that feel very authentic to artists. And I honestly love a like very, very lo-fi video because it just feels like real. It doesn't feel like I had this massive budget to make this big music video. Like these are low budget videos that are are really just about like evoking a concept. And it doesn't need to be something that's like super time consuming, really, really difficult to create and can just be something that's lo-fi and fun and silly. Um, in my, uh, the record label that I released my music with, Spirit Goth, they love sort of this like classically DIY look that sort of is the the vibe of the artists that um, work with Spirit Goth. So um, I, I think, you know, I wanted to make something that like really felt like it fit in the home of other Spirit Goth artists too. Okay, that's, and that's, um, I think most people that have been watching these know that I love all of the different um, approaches to music videos, to, to anyone's art, really, music, film, whatever they're doing. 
Yeah. And, and um, it's great that you're trying to evoke a concept from your music videos and not just saying, well, this is what everyone else is doing, so I need to follow suit and make it <laughs> sure. live, you know, a certain way. It's like, well, no, this is what I want for my music and for my particular yeah. song. And like you said, it also happens to jive with your, your record label's um, roster of artists, too. So it's kind of like, yeah, we're into this. You know, keep doing it. Yeah. That's, that's nice. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm also thinking about something that you had said uh, with the trophy um, in the video. And there was an artist that I covered at the beginning of March, um, and she had put something out saying that she's been doing meet and greets after her shows, um, kind of safely, I guess. Yeah. And saying that, please, if you're going to say something like, Wow, you're so good. How come you're not more popular? Please don't say that to me because it makes me feel, right. it makes me feel yeah. like shit. It's for her words. Yeah, uh, totally. No, completely. Yeah, and I'm sure that, you know the fan is probably like a backhand. And, you know, they think they're making a compliment, and they don't realize it, it can be taken the other way. Yeah, <laughs> so like, totally. That's that doesn't have to be. Yeah, the trophy doesn't have to be the symbol of success. It can be lots of other things. Like you're making a living from this, or you're doing something that you finally have been wanting to do for 20 years. Yes. You finally got it out. You know, totally. that's, a, that's a success, but some people and society is kind of geared as toward this thing of like, it's gotta be a certain level. Otherwise you haven't, you haven't made it yet. And it's kind of like, well, what's that? What's the definition of that? And it's funny, like the show that we played at the sunset the other night, um, we opened for this great band Ducks Limited and we were really lucky to open for them. They're like on tour with Nation of Language. They're like so, so, so good. Um, and we played this show, you know, so many friends of mine came out that were like some friends that I hadn't seen since high school, like, which was 10 years ago now, you know, people that I haven't seen in a long time, some friends that are really close with me. And it felt like such a cool, you know, because we've been in the pandemic, we haven't played a lot of live shows. You know, it doesn't have to be a million streams somewhere to feel like, this great feeling of like, this is what I want to be doing. Making music is so fun. And I think playing for a room of like friends and family and people that like can become friends is, is really, really exciting. And, you know, that feeling of like success has to be measured in some specific way, I think is, is really stressful for artists these days of being like, I have to make something that goes viral. Success has to look like X, Y, Z. I've seen other artists be successful in this way. Why am I not achieving that? And like playing the show, the sunset, having friends there was like, I can be done now. Like, this is so fun. Like, this is the height of my personal feeling of accomplishment. Again, very, very well said. Um, and uh, I, I can think of times when my duo was playing around town about six years ago and playing at a brewery and just the vibe, everything was working. You know, people yeah. that we knew, people we didn't know. Yeah, we had a great time, um, you know, did a few extra songs because people wanted it. And uh, just like that was a huge success to us because my singer and I both felt really good on the drive home. I said, man, that was awesome. This is why you do it. You know, we, we, it just kind of fills your soul. Totally. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that over, you know, 10,000 likes on something and 100%. from people, from the majority of people I don't know. <laughs> um, let alone just that, that interaction also of being live in an in-person environment. Um, I, I know what that was like for me back in October when I finally went back to something in person. Um, uh, curious for yourself, what was your first gig back after all well, at the end of this pandemic or whatever you want to call it? And what was the, what was the emotional state like for you? Yeah. So we played, this was our second show as a band. Um, my band is, um, there's five of us. So I have a drummer. I have a, a keyboardist who also sings. Um, harmonies with me and she's great. Uh, my boyfriend plays lead guitar. Uh, and then I have a friend that's a bass player. So the five of us are Sea Lemon, but I write all of the parts. And so we've been practicing for a couple months now. Um, and we had our first show at Cafe Racer, um, which like just reopened in Capitol Hill. It's like so much bigger now. It took over, I think it was previously Barca. Um, but it's an amazing space. That was our first show. We opened for um, a band called Dark Soft that's also Seattle based and this band Early Internet that's from here. And it was our first show as a band because I moved back to Seattle. I was um, living in New York during the pandemic. I moved back to Seattle because I grew up here. Um, and I, before the pandemic, had never even written my own music. I had played in a band where I was playing like rhythm guitar very, very badly um, because I had just picked up the guitar in 2019. I joined this band being like, please let me in. Um, and they were really nice. And they were like, yeah, you know, play the guitar. And they are playing kind of grunge music. So you put distortion on it. Like, it doesn't really matter what it sounds like. 
Um, and so when I came back to Seattle and I didn't have a band, I was like, okay, I'm going to write my own music, started writing my own music and then put together this band. So this racer show was like the first time I've ever even played my own music, me personally live, which was really, really wild. It was so special. And, uh, it was a great venue and it's just crazy sort of having something in your mind, like a song and then being able to play it in front of a bunch of people who are hearing it for the first time and like seeing their reaction. It feels like something that you are writing in your bedroom, like really comes to life, which is, it, it was crazy. It was really exciting. Yeah, I, I can only imagine to all the different worlds basically coming together for you at that particular gig. Since you just mentioned yeah. that this was your first um, gig with your band, first gig um, of you with your music, putting it out there in front of people at Cafe Racer. Um, and uh, after being in this, you know, year and a half or whatever long pandemic um, and having it just like, boom, here we go. All these things together and, yeah. and, and then go. <laughs> that can probably be a bit overwhelming at first. Yeah, definitely. It was crazy, too, because racer has this like stage that's kind of lifted so you feel like you're sort of like towering over and you can like see everyone in the crowd and it was like wow it was just it was wild being up there and i've never sung on stage before so that was like such a big milestone and some of my band members had like never played the bass on stage or or never sung you know, harmonies on stage and so it was like a, a bunch of our like firsts and so it was kind of like a big milestone for everyone in the group individually which which was sweet yeah no that's i was just gonna say and you took the words right out of my mind there's a bunch of firsts and that, that yeah happened. um and oh that's yeah that's amazing and i i remember the first time i i had written this song just for fun with my deal because we're doing cover songs and we're like we should do like an original song and my singer who had, and friend had done some amazing she does poetry and had like books and books of poetry and she said mark what about this one and it was amazing so i was sitting there trying to put music to it and it just wasn't happening my music was just too goofy forever it wasn't fitting how serious this topic was so i just took the, the title of her poem and then turned it into something else just kind of for fun that would fit our 80s kind of stuff that we were doing and i said we'll come back to your your lyrics um but it's got to be something where uh, we find the music that fits it because this clearly what I was coming up with does not fit this at all. But I just remember playing it and um, people didn't know. They thought it was like we're covering somebody else's song or something. It's like, no, that's, that's funny. Me. That's me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. <laughs> so I, I do know what's the, that's, the, man, it was nerve wracking too. For the, I don't sing um, until I got into this duo and I said, well, I, I need to sing something. <laughs> yeah, I know. Totally. I got, I got a little liquid courage in me. You know, off nice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but it's, yeah, it's an amazing feeling when you finally get to put your art um, out, especially when it's something that you wrote, you did, you, yeah, you were in your apartment or whatever, writing this in a bedroom and then bang, now you're in front of people playing yeah. it on a stage. Um, it gets very, very real to you. Then it's like, wow, this is what that feels like. And it's an amazing feeling. Yeah. It's unreal. It's crazy. And I think, like when I was playing with my band in New York, uh, you know, this was pre pandemic. We were always like, people come out, people would come out. It was great. But like, it felt sort of like everyone was trying to put music out there doing it. This was pre everything stopping. And now it feels like releasing music now playing it live. Everyone has like uh, an increased appreciation for like going and seeing live music with friends. And so it feels like everyone's so excited right now for it. And so, people are like turning out who might not necessarily have turned out before the pandemic. People are like listening who are excited. People want to come support. So it, in some ways, like as awful as it has been the past couple of years, I feel like the, the shining light is that other people are more and more excited about live music than like ever before. You have some wonderful insight. Um, <laughs> you, you really do. And even like always saying, I totally respect your views, been the most insightful ones I've ever heard. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, and I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you're saying some, some wonderful things that I should like write down the quotes. <laughs> no, okay. that. Um, because I, I totally agree with you. There's a reason why I, um, some of the stores that I've been covering locally um, or the ones that are coming through town, I should say, um, are selling out and they're selling at all the yeah. cities and not just here. It's like, I know like Cannibal Corpse are just finishing up their tour now in Florida 
And like every gate on the West Coast, going through the Southwest, going through Texas, like sold out, sold out, sold out. Even here in Seattle, I mean, there were some kids outside the show box at the market saying, hey, how come we can't buy tickets? And dude, <laughs> the show sold out. Yeah. Uh, you know, you snooze, you lose. And you're right. I think there's a lot of people that either one, took music for granted um, during the pandemic and now don't, or two, they were interested in maybe seeing someone perform like yourself. And then it's like, now when the opportunity came, I'm not going to sit on my couch. I'm actually going to go. Yeah. Um, and just experience what this is like. It's like, yeah, don't miss out on the stuff. And as we've learned, unfortunately, uh, in recent weeks, and especially as of yesterday, you can't guarantee that tomorrow is going to come. So whatever you want to do, you need to do it now. Um, so, you know, rest in power, Taylor, from uh, the Foo Fighters for passing. And then last week we lost John Clayton, who is a Hall of Fame sports writer who lived here in Seattle. Um, so it's like, yeah, if you want to go something as small as you want to go to your favorite restaurant, you want to go see a band, you want to go hang totally. out with a friend, haven't seen a family member in a while, and if you feel safe and comfortable with doing it, do it. Don't say next week, next month, next year, because we don't know <laughs> what's going to yeah, come. Yeah, no, I love that. Totally, 100%. Yeah, and um, if we kind of take some steps back, I know that you also have put out Fortune Teller and Sunday. Yes. Um, so let's kind of take Fortune Teller, I guess, next. So what's the story behind that particular song? Yeah, Fortune Teller is a love song. Fortune Teller is a, a song about sort of being in the honeymoon phase of getting to know someone and it, it, you know, like it was written from like a romantic love perspective, but I, I like to think that fortune teller applies in like, especially friendship love, honestly, because the song is about sort of being in the honeymoon phase, getting to know someone and thinking they are so special and amazing. And, you know, when you're in that honeymoon phase, it's like almost impossible to like find flaws with someone because you're like, this person is amazing. I can't believe that they love me, that they care about me. And Fortune Teller is sort of the manifestation of having this fear of being truly vulnerable and the fear that somebody else that you love will like notice your flaws or begin to notice them, but also the desire to fully open yourself up to someone and, you know, being in that stage where it's so exciting and so new that you don't want to mess it up. Um, and, and Fortune Teller is, is really all about that stress of like, how do I position this right? How do I make sure that like, I don't expose myself right too much versus just being like, you know what, maybe I should just let it all hang loose and just be myself. And, you know, that person will eventually, even though I have flaws, like come to love me. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of the crux of Fortune Teller. I'm kind of curious. I have, forgive me, I have a random brain. So I, sometimes yeah. questions come to me that is kind of like, where did that come from, Mark? Um, but when you're talking about um, fortune teller and, and the background behind it, it was the honeymoon period in a relationship and trying to find that, yeah, do I let everything hang out or I just try to kind of preserve what's going so well and leave it the right. way it is? Um, and also what you're talking about with the, the perception behind um, uh, turn away. Uh, I'm kind of curious what your, uh, your background is in terms of like schooling or anything else, because it almost sounds like very philosophical, what you say. <laughs> yeah. You want to know something funny? I minored in philosophy. Um, yeah, I love philosophy. So I my, my full-time job is as a designer. So I work as a designer um, and I do like UX design, um, but you know, I also do like graphic design and I, I love visual arts, but I also minored at UW in philosophy because I, I love sort of the taking apart a problem, taking apart a, a thought and really like deeply getting into critical analysis. And philosophy always felt like a really cool pairing with literally anything. Like you can add philosophy to any kind of degree. I mean, especially design because design is about problem solving ultimately. Um, and I just thought that they married so well. Um, and I, I have always thought that, you know, even though it wasn't like a full degree, the classes that I took at UW in philosophy have like helped prepare me for just like being a person and always knowing like how to get at the root of a, a, an idea or like how to question something fully um, and like how to build critical analysis. So philosophy was a, a really, really important part of my college experience that at first I was like, oh, this is just like fun classes. And 
now I look back being like, ironically, that was like maybe more important than the actual like design degree that I got. Well, as always says, it's, this totally makes sense. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, again, the, the insight you've had and, um, yeah, definitely the, the, the philosophical aspects that were coming through. Yeah. And so that, yep, it's coming through from your, from your minor. Um, and it's interesting too, that you have a design background. You remind me of uh, one of my good friends that's, what's well, also been on some election, but she lives here locally with her husband, um, was working in software design and, um, a lot of computer based things, mm -hmm. but loved. Um, artistic expression. She felt she wasn't doing enough of it. And so that's how I met her many, many years ago. She wanted to get into like modeling and photography. And then now she's been doing painting and she's actually at a film festival right now on the East Coast because she just got her short into a film festival. Whoa, another short. That's so cool. No way. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it, it is awesome. And her husband, I think, um, I think John did the sound design work for that. But you kind of remind me of her because there's a marriage of these two worlds are like very, very, um, I don't want to say analytical, but very educated and spoken very well but then there's also this artistic part of it and you put them together and that that's the, the small piece i don't want to talk about perception but that's the small piece of what's coming so through much. to me based on you yeah no it's um wow i'm incredibly impressed um by your, your thoughts yeah, and how you're expressing yourself and um as i told some guests too you never know how this is going to work and i understand especially for the guests sometimes it can be a little nerve-wracking because they don't know what the interview is going to be like or they're going to be looking for like a bunch of clickbait stuff or they're going to be a jerk or whatever but it's actually a two-way street because i don't know what the artist is going to yeah, be like totally. um i've had some that came on pretty early and i've talked about this on my other live streams that um if anything happened during the pandemic it was that something i had to learn how to really tall i would say tolerate other people's points of view and it was a stretch trust yeah. me when some people was to be talking hey how are you doing and they start telling me a bunch of stuff like, about their opinions and i'm kind of like wow i don't really agree with much of that but um okay totally. <laughs> and and then i still have to make things work because we weren't even live yet so it's mm -hmm. like i don't want to sit there and say well i don't think that's right and we get into right, an right, argument right. <laughs> and then we go live and they're like well i don't want to talk to this jerk and i don't want to talk to you and it's like oh my goodness so it was a process um yeah of trying to figure things out. So no, it's, it's, I welcome guests like you that are so enjoyable to talk to and to interview. Um, and speaking of which, so let's go to the first single that came off um, of the forthcoming EP, Sunday. And uh, what can you tell me about that particular song? Yeah, so Sunday was definitely a song that um, was like an unexpected standout to me personally as I was writing it. Um, what kind of happened with my like relationship with the person I've been um, like working with, who's my producer, but he also does my mixing and mastering for the CP. Um, we like randomly followed each other on Instagram. We had a conversation. He was like, send me some demos. It was all very like happenstance, like circumstance of the internet, just like being online. He lives in California. Um, and so I sent him some demos and I sent like a folder of like 10 demos or something. And I was like, I really feel strongly about Sunday, which at that point was a super, super lo-fi demo that I had like written the week before. And I was just feeling, I don't know if it's like that feeling of when you just finish something where you're like, this is the best one. Cause it's like the most recent. Um, but I was feeling so excited about that song. Um, and he was like, okay, like if you really want to do that one, let's do that one. So that was my first single and uh, I, I, you know, it turned into something so much more than my demo. I wish you could like hear my demo versus the end product, because to me, I had that demo-itis for a while of being like, is this song too different from my demo? Like, I don't recognize it anymore. Um, and then releasing it as my first single was, was really, really scary, um, especially because the entire song was about me being in the pandemic, feeling like it was hard to keep up relationships. And, and this is what Sunday is really all about, which is the anxiety and stress of being like, we're not seeing each other. We're long distance friends. We're in a, in a distance relationship, whatever that looks like. How do I keep up with you in a way that feels like, I don't want to say successful, but like feels purposeful for both of us? Because I feel like in the pandemic, I was just constantly worried about like, am I doing enough for people? You know, what does my relationship look like? Because when you are with people that you care about all of the time in person, you don't necessarily have to 
be constantly establishing what that relationship is in your mind because you're like seeing them all the time. You get to spend time with them. But when you're far apart from people that you care about, you kind of have that added pressure of being like, how can I support you from afar? And I think that Sunday was really a culmination of that feeling of we're far apart. Am I doing enough for you? Um, and uh, it was, it's funny, right? The song is about like anxiety and stress and is kind of like, I don't want to say like a bummer, but it's, it's definitely like a, a deeper emotional song from a lyrics perspective. And like the song is really bright and bubbly and happy sounding. Like I make dream pop music, but I almost was like excited about that dichotomy of the song sounding really peppy and excited and bubbly and it being about such a heavy subject matter because I think so much of what I've been dealing with in the pandemic is that feeling of perception and being like, I'm okay, I'm happy, right? I'm presenting as happy, but like inside the thoughts are like darker and more stressful. And so, you know, if you were to listen to the song the first time and not really listen to the lyrics, you'd be like, this is like a summer road trip song. Like this is a happy song. And then if you get into it, you're like, oh, this is like not necessarily what I was expecting from a lyrical perspective. And and I really like that kind of nuance in music, too. Yeah, no, I, I think when I first saw the press release and I started looking through your music and I and I came to Sunday and, and the video part of it, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, this reminds me of that. There actually was a I, I guess they're still in existence because Tiger Lily kind of gone solo. But there is a local band called Bleach Bear, um, two sisters and a cousin. That play dream pop music um, that I know pretty well, and I was like, "Oh, that kind of reminds me of their music." It's yeah, it's dream pop, and it's kind of fun and light, be and light and um, airy, and that kind of thing. And yeah, as I listened to it, then it became more of like, well, "What's going on here lyrically?" And it's like, <laughs> "It's whoa, this <laughs> this is a little heavier than than I thought." So I love the dichotomy, just like what you mentioned, of the two um, worlds kind of coming together between a serious matter that was going on during the pandemic for you, and then but it's married with this music and also the perception of. That, you know, hey, I'm doing all right, and this is fun, and here's my right. song. It's like, yeah. and if you dig through the layers, like, well, wait a minute, yeah, this is something that I think what works for it though is that people can relate to that because we're all going through that those same difficult feelings during that time. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, for anyone that had any kind of relationship, or it could be with a, a significant other, it could be with really close friends, family members during that time. It's like, yeah, am I doing enough? Am I? I feel so isolated from people. Um, if you live by yourself like I do, then it became really an issue of like. Totally. I, I don't see anybody around. Um, I've kind of half jokingly talked about, you know, like if you happen to go somewhere, you might talk to like, you know, the cash register person a little bit longer than you normally would. Totally. Yeah. You don't, you don't have the interaction that you are just taking for granted all the time. Um, and I know for myself that definitely, I, I, I hit the nail on the head when I started working part time again during the pandemic and uh, talking to my coworker every day. I was like, wow, I didn't realize how much I needed this until yeah. it disappeared. Um, let alone live events and you know everything else that's happened in that communal feeling. So that's that's wonderful. And so you have these three songs and you have an EP that is like in the work. So what what's coming up here in the future then for yeah. C Lemon for you and your music and when can we maybe see this EP release? Yeah, so the EP is going to be out um, sort of late spring, early summerish this year. Um, with uh, Spirit Goth, and uh, they're going to be releasing it. It's five songs. Um, so there's going to be two unreleased songs so far on the EP. Um, and the EP is done. So now we're just, you know, finessing every last sort of bit, getting it all together. Um, and, and we're ready to, to put it out there in the world. So um, I'm really, really excited about it. I, uh, I mean, with Spirit Goth specifically, I reached out to them because uh, my one of my favorite artists, Castle Beat, runs the label and it's super DIY. And all of the artists are like very um, like awesome dream pop, indie, bedroom pop, shoegaze type of music, which is like what I love to listen to and, and definitely what I like to make. Um, and so releasing with them is like a year ago, I would have been like, what are you talking? That's insane. Like, that's like one of my favorite artists. So it's it's a really cool milestone for for me personally but they've been so awesome and and have been really like supportive of you know what song do i think is like the next single what do they think about you know like some of the visual stuff my music video they are are really really helpful so 
Um, it's been a total blast. So that'll be coming out this year pretty soon. Um, and, and we'll be making some announcements about that uh, in the in the near future. Um, but that's kind of what's, what's on my plate. And then we've got a bunch of shows in Seattle coming up. We're playing uh, uh, April 8th at Barboza, which is like our headline show. Um, and so we're playing with this great band that's opening for us, Beach Vacation, um, who also makes kind of similar genre music to me. Um, they're awesome, they're local. And then we're uh, opening for um, somebody named Austin Weber at Madame Lou's, which is like the crocodile sort of new extension um, that we're really excited about on, on April 28th. Um, so we've got that and then we're gonna be playing block party this summer. So we're we're really hitting all the the awesome Seattle venues. I'm I'm feeling really, really lucky because I grew up here and I always loved going to shows as a kid in Seattle. I lived in Redmond, so I would like take the city bus over to Seattle. We'd like go to shows. I loved live music as a kid. I loved like block party and bumper shoot and like folk life as a kid. So playing venues that like are new revamped venues that I went to as a kid or even in college and now playing them is like, whoa, it feels so weird. So it's it's been awesome. Well, that, that yeah, no, that's got to be amazing. And it's, it's great that um, that we know like a, a rough timeline and when the EP is coming out and then that you have a bunch of shows to play. I love it when um, artists get out there and play their music of any genre. Um, yeah. It's one thing to create it in your home space or your home studio or, or recording studio or anything like that. But for me, and my roots are like in rock and metal. So it's like those bands never got support from pretty much anything. You had to tour. You had to get out there and play your music. And so I love it when other bands do that because yeah, then you get a chance to experience it in person. And um, so I was writing down the dates, <laughs> do you, the, yeah. at least the two in April, because I know like the 8th I can't do because I'm at uh, the Paramount that night, but the 28th of April, I'll look because I don't think I have anything scheduled that far out. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah, and I've been needing to get to the Crocodile because I haven't been there since. It, I haven't it, been to Madame Luz either. Yeah, I know. It's supposed to be great. That's that's what I heard. There was just a show there this past Monday that I was looking at. I said, I wonder if I should go to that show because that's the small room. I know there's the other room and small I meaning it's like 300 people it holds now, right. uh, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, so I this is great for me that I had a chance to talk to somebody and I might actually get to go see you play yeah. and say like, when are they coming to town? You know, maybe in six months, maybe in nine months, maybe never. It's like in this case, no, Mark, just look at their, well, look at social media or look what have yeah. you and see what are the dates coming up. Um, and I ask this of almost every music guest when they have something new coming out. Do you have any kind of merchandise uh, planned or is there something already available? Is the EP going to be in any kind of physical format? Yeah, good question. Um, so we're going to, um, the great thing about Spirit Goth is they do cassettes. They do like a monthly cassette subscription. So um, my music is going to be on cassette and then I'm going to be able to um, at some of my live shows have cassettes of um, my music, which is really, really exciting. Uh, Cause that's just like so fun. It's kind of like really representative of that, like lo-fi energy, like it's lo-fi music. So we've got like old school cassettes, which is great. Um, so we're going to have that. And then we're thinking about other kinds of merch. You know, we, we haven't really planned anything out so far, but that is like, that's a next step. That's definitely where we want to get to next. Okay, cool. I, I have tape players. <laughs> you do? That's great. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I, we drive a like 2000 Jeep. And so it has a tape cassette in it. So I'm really excited to be able to actually use the cassette in my, in my old, old Jeep, um, like for the first time in a real way. So, so it'll be great. Oh, that's going to be awesome that you'd be rolling down the road and you've got your own music blaring out of <laughs> <laughs> with like terrible speaker system, just absolutely <laughs> awful and you know, 20 years old, but yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, I'm glad you have some kind of physical aspect to your EP coming out. Yeah. Um, I, I've had so many musicians say that, well, we'd love to, or we'd love to do vinyl, but you know, there's a backlog or it costs too much. Or I said, what about a t-shirt? What about, what about anything? And if you're yeah. looking at sustainability things, there's, there's different organizations you can pair with if you want to do something like that. It's like there, there are ways to do this. And um, so I love it that you're already thinking that yeah. way. You're trying to figure out what's next. And when we get to, um, I would assume a, an EP release show locally at some point, maybe the summer, what's going to be there for people to buy to help support yeah, what you definitely. do and, and all that kind of thing. And, um, and, and you mentioned, I'm kind of going way back, but 
you mentioned that you were learning how to play guitar like at 19 or something and that oh, you in were 2019 2019 um and so so prior to that did you have any musical training whatsoever yeah i grew up playing piano like a lot and um i was suzuki trained which is like ear training and so still i'm horrible at reading music like basically can't um but i grew up playing the piano then i wanted to in college and more so even pre-college in high school wanted to go into a and r so i really wanted to be on the other side i loved live music and i wanted to like scout bands and do all of that in college and after college i was not playing music at all like whatsoever and then a friend of mine who you had on meredith um she uh, we were living together and she got a guitar and she brought it home in 2019 and i was like this seems fun and then that got me playing and we learned on it she she brought home an electric guitar and an electric is so much easier to play than an acoustic and if there's anything that like i would like to impart on like young girls everywhere it's like start with a cheap electric guitar not an acoustic because an acoustic is so hard to play it's like heavy it's intense the strings are quite heavy i learned on this electric i was like oh i can play the guitar like i can figure this out i still have a hard time playing an acoustic guitar um but i learned on an electric and then went from there and started writing my own music and kind of you know once you know bar chords you can kind of just the the sky is is the limit so um that was kind of the process which really has only been a couple years since she brought home that electric guitar. Oh, wow. I had no idea that you guys used to be roommates. Yeah, we were roommates. We lived in New York together. We went to college together. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, had, <laughs> I had no clue whatsoever. So yeah. there's a small world. <laughs> it is. It's a really, and she makes amazing music. So she's always been like an inspiration for me when I've been like, I want to write music. She's like, Here's what I'm using. I'm like using Ableton. I use these tools. I, you know, I start with this. And so she, she has really helped sort of like guide my, you know, artistic journey in a lot of ways, just by being like a helping hand through the process. That's awesome. And for people that are watching this down the road, we're talking about work wife, which is also on my YouTube channel. So you can watch that, you know, when you have some free time, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's who Meredith is. Um, and, Wow. Well, so when you went to guitar, it wasn't like you had like no background whatsoever. You had played piano, you were doing your training and everything else. So at least that makes a little bit more sense to me. Cause I'm like, dang, if you just picked up a guitar and joined that grunge band and we're you know, playing rhythm kind of like, yeah, I mean, I, and I understand what you were saying when you're taking, you know, you can use distortion. You don't really <laughs> notice what your yeah. skill level is, but, um, cause that's my main instrument is guitar. So, you know, but yeah, that makes much more sense because the songs I'm hearing, especially the things that you're writing about and then how you're putting them together sounds much more seasoned to me. Oh, than, thank you. Yeah. Than someone who just kind of, and there's nothing wrong with people just, you know, I want to start no, somewhere, no, no. but, but um, yeah, it's like, well, this sounds like maybe you had done some other things prior to it, which you just explained you did. So. Yeah. And I think that the most helpful things for me in like writing my own songs is one obviously like the privilege of being able to like have a job that paid for me to be able to buy instruments like buy a bass buy a guitar has been monumental has been so helpful it, it would be so hard to like work on production if you're like i don't know how to like buy instruments they're so expensive there's definitely a barrier of entry so like ways to make the process of getting into music not so like just full of obstacles from a price perspective is something that like I feel really passionate about. I think that everyone should have access to creating music. And, and I think that production is something that at this point is quite expensive to start. Um, but for me, you know, it was great because my boyfriend played the bass. So we kind of had a bass around so I could like, you know, once you can play the guitar, you're like, yeah, I can play the bass. It's basically the same thing. It's not, but you know what I mean? Like, being able to create an entire song because you just like literally have the physical tools helps so much. And, and it's really hard to get started if you're like, all I have is, a, a, you know, acoustic guitar. Another insightful comment from Natalie folks. Um, because yeah, 
for me, I took it for granted that my older brother um, played drums, had a drum set, and my mom had bought a bass at one point, and, um, and I had a guitar that I didn't even ask for. I got it for Christmas many, many years ago. So it's just like, oh, these things are here, so I can go from one right. instrument to the next to the other, but then someone else, they may not have any of those things. Yeah. And can you mind if I borrow your guitar for, you know, for a weekend or something? Or can I come over after school and then plunk around on it for a little bit? And then maybe I can bug my mom to buy me one for Christmas or for my birthday. Um, yeah, there's definitely obstacles. And if someone has even the access to technology, kind of assume that people have, you know, if it's a laptop or a tablet or a phone, and some people have maybe something really old or something that can't do what they needed to do to even to do something electronically yeah. you know, for music, um, it can be... Yeah, it can be a barrier. So I love that you're um, really passionate about trying to create accessibility for anyone yes. that wants to create, basically. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, and I, I see Ove asked the question, but what inspired you to call the band Sea Lemon? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Uh, a sea lemon is a, um, it's like a sea slug. It's a type of sea slug that is um, native to the Pacific Northwest uh, and my mom growing up was um, a beach naturalist on the side. And what a beach naturalist is, is I don't know if this is like the same terminology everywhere, but she would go out to like Edmonds Beach and go and teach little kids what they were seeing via the aquarium. So she was like wearing an aquarium vest and little kids would come up to her and she'd be like, oh, you're looking at this type of kelp. This is native to the Pacific Northwest, blah, blah, blah. And so I always love that my mom did that. You know, I have always been really into marine biology, especially as a kid. I thought that the first job I was ever going to have was uh, discover the, gi the giant squid. And I was really bummed when they found it um, and they, they saw it live. But uh, she really inspired me as a kid to like get into discovery. And so sea lemon is kind of a representation of like that side of discovery and my relationship with my mom and, um yeah okay cool and i know one thing for myself when i was doing some research um on your on your music and your art that um it's just a pure coincidence there's someone else out there with sea lemon that's not music but i know that it does like hobbies like yeah. crafts yeah. yeah it does all this diy stuff and here you are lo-fi diy with your, i know uh, i should have thought about that one a little bit more but you know she's she does her own cool thing too but people are always like sea lemon are you doing crochet I'm like, well, not exactly. You know what would be interesting is if you manage to do some sort of partnership with her and she creates something that you sell at your shows. Right? I know. <laughs> That'd be so funny. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just thought, I just remember, I just remember seeing DIY like in her description of something. It's like, here you are talking about I know, your, I know. your approach. Like <laughs> But that's cool. I mean, you're on. You're coming from the same the same mindset, at least for you know the DIY yeah. part of it. So, thanks for the question, Ove and um, Natalie. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, gosh, it was almost been an hour. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and I really enjoy the music, and I'm looking forward to the EP release. And um, yeah, I will be looking at your socials to kind of make sure that I see these dates that are coming up for shows and yes, see. Yes, I would I, love I, that. Please come. That would be so awesome to have you. I would. It would be awesome to be there and finally get back there. I love there. it. So you do your thing live and um, be around the whole communal feeling when you're back at a concert. And yeah. Um, yeah, and if you have something, and it's gonna be like when you know the release date is coming out, if you wanna come back on and do another one of these, I would love to have you come back. Oh, great, but, amazing, yeah, that would be amazing. Cool, because I, as I've mentioned to other people, I love when guests come back and there's more of that, um, uh, that relationship is kind of there. Um, yeah, totally. And we can ask, so what are you doing now? And, um, Last year, the very first guest I had in 2021 was a ER physician from France. And so we we're talking about the pandemic, of course, and everything else that was going on in her world. But then at the very end of December of 2021, I asked her if she would come back so we can kind of bookend this thing. Kind of, so what's going on over in your part of the world? Wow. Uh, things changed. And um, I, I'm fascinated with people and especially people that are doing really good things like yourself. So I, well, I do like to see what you're doing. Yeah. And, and keep uh, promoting what you're doing. And um, Let's see, will you post her socials? Uh, what are the, these, these socials for people to follow you on? Yeah, um, my Instagram is at it's C Lemon, and my Twitter is at C Lemon Music. There you go, everybody. So now you know how to um, follow um, Natalie socially and hopefully keep your perceptions in check. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, 
But Natalie, thank you again so much. Thank and uh, I, I, yeah, I look forward to either connecting with you virtually or seeing you in person on a stage. Yes, let's do it. Okay, thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.